Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Diana Colavecchio, the Community Development Director for the City of Cuyahoga Falls. And I wanna welcome you to this evening's webinar. If you have logged into the public forum to, do, to be part of the master plan for the Merriman Valley Schumacher areas, that is a co-hosted event by the City of Cuyahoga Falls and the City of Akron, you are in the right place. This webinar was to start at six o'clock. I apologize that we're just a little bit behind schedule here, but we wanted to make sure we had all of our technology in order. So uh, at this time, uh, we're gonna go through a few introductions. And I also wanna first start by having our mayors welcome you. And at this moment, I'm gonna turn it over to Mayor Don Walters, who wants to say a few words to all of you who've been kind enough and gracious enough to listen in tonight. So with that, Mayor Walters, are you on the line and able to say a few words for us? Mayor Walters may have trouble logging in at this moment. How about Mayor Horgan? If you're out there and you want to go first, we'll have you say a few words. I am on if he's not here. I got my audio. Oh, good. oh good. Thank you, Mayor Walters. Go ahead. I introduced you. We didn't, weren't sure that you had uh, gotten logged in yet, but the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I'm live. And thank you, everyone, for jumping on the call here. I know this is exciting. It's the next step of the process. I want to thank you for all your continued involvement, thank Far and Associates, all the work they've done to this point, and also thank Mayor Horgan and his staff. As you know, this is unprecedented for two cities to come together to do the right thing. So it always feels good when we can do that. So at this point, I will turn it over to Mayor Horgan if he is on the call. Uh, I know he is, and Sydney, he just said that he needs to be unmuted. Hey, give me one second, guys. Might he be able to raise his hand so I can see which caller he is? I'm sorry. I'll let him know. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I, I believe I've given permission to talk. Sydney, I, uh, I can get you uh, his number uh, just to make sure you've got the right person. Okay. I'll put it in the chat, just a second. Can everybody hear me now? Yes. Hello. Yes, Mayor. Yes. Oh, thank God. Um, yeah, the last thing you want to do is hold up a Zoom meeting for technical difficulties. So I apologize uh, for not being able to join um, via video. But yeah, let me uh, first thank Mayor Walters and the City of Cauga Falls, really for I think a, a really has, an historic collaboration. Uh, excited, really, about proving the look and the form and function of the valley, and um, looking forward to the uh, a lot of the recommendations as we plan out the future 
uh, of what it looks like down there uh, and working that into our capital budget. I know even some general conversations over the last five or six months and coming up with ideas like the riparian setback that uh, Councilman Fusco and I have been talking about for months. And we'll eventually get to that particular point, but wanted to see these recommendations come forward first. So thank you all for being on and really uh, thank both cities um, for that collaborative effort in, in moving forward. So thanks again. At this time, we're gonna have Dan Rice, who's gonna serve as our moderator tonight, talk a little bit with you about what you're gonna see here, how, how this meeting's gonna progress, uh, talk to you about when you'll have an opportunity to ask your questions and et cetera, et cetera. So Dan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, and again, I just also wanna thank everyone for joining us here this evening, uh, especially during this really busy holiday season. Um, we know that you're taking away time from either your family, your holiday shopping, or maybe even work to be here with us this evening. And so we really pre greatly appreciate your incredible commitment um, to join us here. And we're also grateful for your dedication and passion to this important community project. Um, we've had a lot of community conversations over the past six months. And this is just another step in the journey as Mayor Walters and Mayor Horgan you know, shared with us just previously. Um, but before we go further, I just really kind of want to point out really the obvious. I um, mean, that is, this is truly a transformational and groundbreaking work. Um, for the first time, at least in my memory, my lifetime, we have two communities really coming together, working collaboratively. And I think that's really something that we need to celebrate um, and acknowledge, because that maybe hasn't happened always in the past, but it's happening now, and it happens for a reason because of leadership. And so I'm really grateful to Mayor Walters, Mayor Horrigan, um, uh, Ms. Diana Colavecchio, Mr. Jason Segedi, and their entire team, because they're the ones that are really making this happen and bringing this project to fruition in partnership with the residents. Uh, we could not do this work without the residents. So thank you so much for being here this evening. I also want to uh, thank you for your patience with our technology. If it wasn't for a pandemic, we, we'd all be together, um, but we can't. Uh, so this is the next best thing. We know it's not perfect. Um, and I know we got 215 people listening here or watching. Um, so we really appreciate um, your patience with the technology. And so here's how this evening's gonna go. It's pretty straightforward, actually pretty similar to how we operate our planning commission meetings. Um, we're gonna have some background information um, from Ms. Colavecchio. Uh, Mr. Segedi is gonna bring us up to date on the process to date. Um, and, and both of them, between the two of them, they're gonna provide background information and how we got here. That's gonna be followed by an update on the plan by our esteemed uh, professional planners, uh, Doug Farr, Farr with uh, Farr and Associates. And what I really just wanna kind of uh, set the, the framework for is, um, this is presentation this evening is based upon everybody's feedback to date, as well as all the research and development that has been ga gathered over the past six months. This brings us to this moment. But the key thing to keep in mind is, this is just another step in the process. Um, following the presentation by Mr. Doug Farr, there will be an opportunity for questions. And that's when we'll actually open up the question box. And so the chat feature is gonna be disabled for this meeting because we want people to focus their attention exclusively on Mr. Farr. We want you to, to be really digesting that plan, but keeping in mind, because you haven't seen it previous to tonight, you know, we know that it's going to be probably your first time seeing it. So you're probably going to be thinking about it and maybe just reflecting upon it in the days to come. So following this meeting, this information will be available out on the website. So I don't want people to think that this is the only time they're going to get a chance to, to comment or provide feedback. There are going to be multiple steps beyond this. This is just our obligation to come back to the community to provide an update on the status of this important transformational pro project. So I hope that kind of sets the framework for what we're gonna do this evening. Um, again, I want, I want to encourage people to really uh, keep an open mind as they're really digesting this information. And there will be a time this evening uh, at following the presentation where we'll be able to answer as many questions as possible. So that's the process for this evening. Uh, and again, I just wanna thank everybody for joining us um, on this really exciting journey. And now I'm gonna return it back over to uh, Ms. Colvecchio, Diana. Thanks, Dan. And so everyone knows Dan Rice is the chair of the planning 
and uh, zoning commission in Cuyahoga Falls. He does an excellent job, as you can tell, of explaining procedure. And that's why we've asked him to serve as our MC tonight. So he will con be conducting MC type duties throughout the evening. At this time, I wanna introduce our team here in Cuyahoga Falls. As Dan mentioned, these plans don't just happen in a vacuum. Uh, it is the collaboration of many people. Inside Cuyahoga Falls City Hall, this is our team on the screen right here. These are the people that have attended the bulk of the meetings, have, have had major imp, uh, input into what you're gonna see tonight in terms of what our city and our development code provide and can and should provide as we go forward. So you've heard from our mayor, Don Walters, and Rob Kurtz is our planning director, Adam Paul, our senior planner, Mary Spoggy, our deputy C director. And we've had two uh, council people who have taken a special interest in the Merriman Valley Master Plan, and that's both Russ Balthus, who serves at large, and Frank Stamps, who's the Ward 8 councilman, and this planning area is in Ward 8. So at this moment, I just want to give a bit of an overview of how we got here. And it begins with the city of Cuyahoga Falls undertaking two housing developments back in 2019. And the first of those was called Sur Zurich Trail. And the second of those was called Sycamore. Sycamore was built on a golf course. And at the time, we had planning commission meetings, we had city council meetings, and I never seen so many people crowded into those meetings to voice their le truly legitimate concerns about development in those areas. And that area, of course, meaning on the, on the edge of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So their concerns consisted of a number of things. Of course, primarily environmental issues. Uh, they were worried about run or water runoff into the river, the ecological effect of that, what it might do to our fish in the river and, and other species. They were worried about the density, that we were building too many homes on an acre. We, they were worried about the fact that these uh, developments were uh, in close proximity not just to the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, but also our own summit metro parks. And they actually had some good insight in suggesting that we should be marketing the area as a gateway to these parks and marketing the recreational aspects of the area, specifically hiking, biking, and the river, which became a new draw for water sports in our city. Um, some of you may know that the USA Today had named the Cuyahoga River as the number one river for kayaking in the country. And we've seen that. We've seen water sports totally explode with kayaking and um, canoeing in our own city. The other thing that they wanted us to do was to be mindful that this area draws visitors from all over. I think the Cuyahoga Valley National Park draws some 7 million visitors a year. And that, so we should be mindful that this should be a place of ecotourism, a place of celebration of the natural resources that exist here. And they asked us, to please pause all con continuing building and development. And let's start a conversation. Let's talk about the impact that we are making when we develop this very precious area of natural resources. And we listened and we heard their cry for help and their ask. And we immediately starting had, uh, started to have meetings with them internally inside of City Hall and had a couple of meetings with them. And out of those meetings grew a list of what I began to refer to as aspirations. And I asked them and uh, actually tasked them with putting together a list of aspirations of what it is exactly they hoped that we could achieve by having these conversations before we continue to develop. And the aspiration that still sticks out even today is the one that asked that we create a model, a model code to hold up to other all communities bordering the Cuyahoga Valley National Park as the best practices for development and more importantly, redevelopment uh, in the area. That that would be something not just Cuyahoga Falls would be uh, on board for addressing and adhering to, but perhaps all the communities around the park. So the best way to move forward was to do what we're doing right now. And that is to have a master plan. And a master plan is a very lengthy process and in a moment, uh, I'm going to turn the, the microphone over here to Jason Segedy of Akron, and he's going to talk to you about that process. But what I um, uh, had, that had to do really was get the, the uh, uh, partnership of the city of Akron on board to be part of that master plan, uh, primarily because much of this Merriman Valley is divided between the city of Cuyahoga Falls and Akron. And we can't really move forward in a way that 
satisfies the residents of Akron or of Cuyahoga Falls rather without satisfying the residents of Akron because it overlaps with their uh, with their landmass as well. So we started having conversations and reached out to the planning department in Akron and found out uh, some very good news. And that was that they shared our vision for what this area could be and should be. And then we uh, found out even better news and that was that they were willing to share the costs of a master plan. And so the two of us partnered together and that is exactly uh, where we ended up. Uh, we started the RFQ process, a request for qualifications to find the best consultant in the area of, of en environmental and ecotourism types of development. And that's our, our uh, consultant that you're gonna hear from tonight and that's Doug Farr and his team. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our partners in Akron. And again, we can't thank them enough for all of the, all of the knowledge and wisdom and guidance that they've brought to the table on this project. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Uh, I'll be brief because I know everybody here wants to get into the uh, draft re recommendations for the master plan, but I did want to, uh, just like Diana did, introduce our team briefly, already heard from Mayor Horrigan, uh, but I wanted to thank my staff, Helen Tomic, Mike Antonucci, and Daniel D'Angelo. Done a great job on this project. Uh, I wanted to thank, uh, I, I know there are a couple of members of Akron City Council that are here tonight. I saw them in the participants. Uh, Jeff Fusco, who's our at-large uh, planning committee chair on city council, as well as Councilwoman Holland in Ward 1 and Council, Councilman Ma Malik in Ward 8, and uh, thank them for their participation. Um, I'll just kind of pick it up where Diana left off on the process. I mean, I think everybody here is aware that uh, the Merriman Valley is a unique place. It's a place that's been both at the forefront of significant public efforts to preserve uh, the natural environment, as well as one where significant planning and urban development challenges exist. Uh, both of our cities have worked hard and supported efforts to steward the natural environment, whether that's the metro parks, the creation of the Tyga Valley National Park, uh, the completion of the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath trail, that's a great, all of those are great assets for our region, as well as the work that the city of Akron's done on uh, significantly improving the water quality in the Cuyahoga River with the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent uh, for our sewer projects to help uh, reduce the amount of sewage going into that water. So I think there's a lot of successes to build on uh, at the same time, though, as everybody knows, due to the physical geography, some of our outdated zoning regulations, the crazy uh, boundary that Diana mentioned between the two cities, there's a lot of room for improvement. I think most people would agree the built environment uh, is a lower quality than it could otherwise be. Uh, one of the goals of this plan is to try to make that better over time. So really our process to date, it's focused on both of those realities. The reality that there's a lot of strength to build on in the Valley, uh, both the strength of the natural environment as well as the spirit of collaboration and partnership between the two mayors, uh, but also the reality that the built environment in the Valley could be and should be better in the future than it is today. So uh, that's where the FAR team comes in and I'm about to turn it over uh, to Doug Farr to go through the draft master plan, I just add as a little bit of a uh, foreshadowing to that, you know, what we've been doing up to date the last couple months, the FAR team has looked extensively at land use, urban design, zoning, transportation, the environment, uh, and the residential and retail market in the Merriman Valley. Uh, we did an extensive three-day planning charrette back in August. I know many of you on this call were there in attendance at Tadaro's. Uh, we had several hundred people come out. We had residents of the public as well as property owners. Uh, I think we made some really good progress there to get feedback uh, from a lot of you and from many other people who couldn't be there tonight. Um, we've really had dozens of in-depth discussions between the two cities planning and development staffs uh, and the consultant team in order to identify uh, both the challenges and the opportunities in this area and to craft some specific recommendations for meeting the challenges and building on the opportunity. So tonight you're going to see a presentation by the consultant team to share those recommendations uh, and to, uh, to take you through where we are right now in the process. We'll have the moderated Q&A as Dan mentioned and then 
I believe I'm going to wrap up a little bit about the next step. So with that, I will turn it over to Doug Farr and our consultant team. Thank you, Jason. Um, I want to uh, thank you, Mayor Walters, Mayor Horrigan, Dan Rice for being our moderator, Diana and Jason for laying it out. Um, there's more thanks yet to be done. I want to acknowledge the contributions of the review board. If those of you can see the slide here, I won't name everyone, but uh, we had some excellent um, uh, guidance that was necessary to kind of steer the steer the ship above and beyond uh, the excellent guidance given by the two staffs. So uh, thank you, review board. Um, briefly, here's the project timeline. Uh, you know, we started back in April. Uh, we're wrapping up this phase um, uh, today, this month in early January, and then the the for, the coding part, the kind of zoning and coding part, takes over in in, in next year. We won't be talking about that much uh, that will kick off in the new year. And so here's where we are in the process. So anyway, thanks everybody. It's really exciting. I, I, I can only amplify what everyone has said about the historic nature of this. And I think um, what I would say as a planner, um, this project attracted us. It's a good fit for what we do. And yet it challenged us to the nth degree because Cuyahoga Valley has every planning challenge and every planning opportunity. So I think what you'll see is, is our best efforts in a lot of categories where we had to stretch to invent new tools and invent new thinking on how to kind of address the unique uh, opportunities here in the Valley. So, so um, as many people have referenced, this is part of a long process. We've been listening for months and we continue to listen tonight. So there will be um, you know, yet uh, further documents about how the discussion goes and if there's any tweaks and so on, those, those are still uh, the doors open to do those things. So, but we did start with some community surveys back, uh, back a ways. Uh, I think this was in the summer. So I just wanted to kind of remind people at a really high level, we asked a few questions. And so one was, you know, if you could only do one thing, what would you focus on? And it was natural landscapes. And I think we've done, uh, you'll be the judge, but I think we've done an honorable job of that. We didn't ignore the other two, but we really put a shoulder into natural landscapes. Second one, this is about new development. So um, how involved should the towns, the cities be in promoting new, new good development, good new development? Um, and the, clear guidance back was write the, adopt the right rules and then provide incentives where, where that makes sense. So, so that's what you'll see those priorities reflected in the final report. And then finally, this is, this is an interesting thing because I think when we started this project, this wasn't maybe the thing that was on people's minds, but um, you know, how involved should the two cities be in making the existing development in the Valley walkable? And goodness, there was a kind of overwhelming plurality, you know, 89% basically said, yes, get the rules right. Yes, provide incentives, but wait, go beyond that. This needs to happen. And so the, the cities should be encouraged to take a more active role in facilitating the projects that the plan calls for. So, so I uh, hold this against this, but I think we've listened and you'll see the plan should, should re reflect that. So, so we're gonna introduce the plan and it is done. Um, uh, here's, here's the way we're doing this. I'm gonna present it. Um, submit Dan uh, questions to the moderator in the chat and we'll pick them up in the discussion po point, panel discussion follow, and then uh, the recording and the chat will be available after the meeting for those of you who love hearing it again. So actually Doug, Doug, just one clarification, we're Please. asking participants to use the Q and A feature for questions, not the chat. Okay, sorry. Okay, thank you, yes. So here we go. So we did not do this work alone. And I believe several members, maybe all of the members of our consultant team are on the, on the Zoom tonight. Um, project was led by our office, FAR Associates based in Chicago. We have a focus on sustainable, sustainability, sustainable urbanism, sustainable conservation, all of it. Um, but we have partners and friends that allow us to do our work at the highest levels nationally. And that includes Paul Crabtree and the Crabtree Group from California. Land Use USA, Sharon Wood from Michigan, and then Lee Einsweiler of Code Studio from Austin, Texas. So we really have uh, you know, dots on the map across the country to get the best expertise nationally that we could bring to bear here in Cuyahoga Valley. So um, first of all, just to introduce the project map, right? If you can see the kind of red line here, that kind of light perimeter, we are sparing your eyes, the jiggy jaggy map of the two municipalities, which really does look like an unfinished 
a jigsaw puzzle uh, between the two towns, but it's the, the boundaries are still somewhat jiggy jaggy. Um, I will lead you through it. This, this area encompasses 1,097 acres. So it's one and a half square miles ish. And so we've done our best to kind of get it right. Um, you know, in every nook and cranny, there will probably be some level of detail we didn't get to. <clears throat> you know, at any specific thing you look at, it's like, hmm, what's going on there? Uh, not every square foot is, is planned, but overall, overall it is. So here we go. So here's, there's two nodes we're gonna be talking about. Uh, one here um, in uh, Akron, and then one here in Cuyahoga Falls. And you'll hear quite a lot about those two. Um, and those were chosen at the beginning of the project as sort of special nodes, one in each town. So at a, as part of a planning process, we benefit from having some visionary words and values and uh, goals um, that sort of guide the project. So let me just start with the vision statement. And this was developed fairly early on in the process. So, uh, and I'll just read it. The Merriman Valley is a gateway to the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. And, and given that, let's make this special place a global model of land conservation and sustainable development by piloting innovations in, in planning and regulation. So boy, is that a big packed thing, but uh, if you take it apart piece by piece, I think you'll see we're gonna cover every part of this tonight. Um, what it says in a nutshell is not business as usual. We're gonna try some new stuff here. We're gonna take some risks in piloting innovations. Innovations is it hasn't been done before. So, so um, we'll see how that all unfolds as the plan uh, is presented tonight and then the code next year. We developed three goals um, that we believe are consistent with what we heard from all of the community input from hundreds and hundreds of folks. Um, first one is conserve. So we take that to mean to plan and code undeveloped private land as models of sustainability. Second is to transform, to transform existing development into beautiful, vibrant, and accessible places. And then third, to activate to promote ecotourism by optimizing access to green space, trails, the Cuyahoga River, and the National Park. So hopefully this makes sense. Um, these are powerful guiding principles. And then values. So at a time of a uh, national global pandemic, um, and we're now shifting to virtual platforms, um, I think it's ever more important that we keep a focus on sort of civic engagement, uh, courtesy to one another, listening, transparency, I won't read all these words, but you can see this is just, this is the golden rule. And I think we were well served to generally follow that. And I, I'm glad that uh, uh, Dan is, is here tonight to you know, uphold uh, with all of us the highest values. So thank you everyone for your contribution to do, doing that. So, so as I said, we are still listening. It is a draft report, um, you know, tweaks uh, will most certainly happen in one sort or another. Um, so here we go. So the plan, because it is so large at 1,097 acres, we're gonna introduce it at four different scales. Uh, the image of the valley, the valley as a gateway to the national park is the highest level. So kind of, and it, 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 you'll really appreciate it. I think it'll get you thinking to hear this section. Corridors, so corridors is the second level and that is corridors are not surprisingly linear. You know, they follow a road or a stream or a ridge uh, or a power line or a train track. Those are all corridors. So, so that's the second level. The third level is neighborhoods, which are, you know, walkable pockets of, of uh, human settlement. But conservation neighborhoods have some added perks and added, added expectations with them. And then finally, we'll drill down in some detail in nodes A and B, what we're calling the valley and then Northampton corners. So. So here's the first unveiling, da, 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 da. take a screenshot if you want, of the overall master plan. As I said, 1, 1,097 acres. I will lead you through, uh, you know, I think pretty much every aspect of it. Um, so this is the kind of what's called the illustrative plan where it sort of shows in colored renderings kind of what, you know, how it might play out. Uh, and by the way, plans do not happen overnight. I should say this. Uh, plans often take a decade or two, sometimes a generation or two. And so the valley, the area that we're planning for, um, has only been gotten a dusting of planning, honestly, in its kind of developed history. It's mostly 
kind of been left to its own devices and I think is the worst for, worse for it. So um, what, what I think will be true as this plan is debated, adopted, and then codes are put in place to implement the plan, you will see in over, not months, but in years, a change of outcome. So we're really excited about that. So um, this is a, a kind of analytical drawing that we planners do to just sort of categorize the land in the study area. So let me just take you through it. First one is this idea of nature corridors. You know, our mandate was take care of nature. And so there are parts of nature that are, that are essential both to hyd hydrologic health, um, habitat health for, for vertebrates, you know, deer, squirrel, raccoon, the whole thing. They benefit to have habitats that are connected. So you'll see about that. Um, second is the node of the valley, which we've talked about. The third is the node of Northampton Corners, which we will talk about quite a lot. Fourth is a kind of um, catch-all that we call conservation neighborhoods. And so people will hear that and say, oh, you wanna develop the whole thing. Absolutely, that is not our intent. So we'll take you through the kind of all of the above strategy for how you do land conservation on top of privately owned land with, with the right to develop it. And then finally, existing developments in the outside of the two nodes, the existing developments we took our, we left our left as is, uh, that that's done and uh, we don't have a lot of power to sort of change it. So, so that's, those are the five sort of classifications. So first one is the valley as a gateway. So I think uh, we were excited that the RFP was really clear about this. Um, and, you know, being from Chicago, we didn't know much about the national park, but we sure know about gateway cities around the country. And so I wanted to sort of start our thinking by kind of taking a little travel tour uh, to four different gateway cities that are all adjacent to national parks in different parts of the country. So, so um, this is, in some ways, this is the competition, right? This is the competition to the Valley for that image of an ecotourism gateway. So Estes Park kind of sells itself. You have the Rocky Mountains, you have the Flatirons, and you have these sort of quaint, you know, turn of the 20th century <clears throat> um, lodges. It's a postcard view of a piece, you know, you, you kind of just publish this and people want to come here, right? So sort of similarly um, with Jackson Hole, Wyoming and the Tetons. So the mountains sell themselves What's in the foreground? A charming cowboy Western town, you know, with the, you can see the mud and the cowboy boots and just like, yep, that's what I expect to see there. I bet it's going to be special, really cool, uh, and so on. So Gatlinburg, I include in here just as the sort of scary monster of gateway towns. You know, the, the Smokies are great, but Gatlinburg is just kind of a, you know, a family, um, there's a Madame Tussauds there, there's water slides. It's like, pretty sprawly mess, but anyway, is another kind of example out there of a place that is flatter, uh, you know, like as a lot of, you know, central, central US and Midwest places are, it doesn't have the dramatic peaks of the West. So it's working a little harder. And then the kind of fourth example I show here is Elon, Minnesota. And people have heard of the Boundary Waters, which is up on the Minnesota Canada border. And, you know, that is a push point of uh, a launch point for what is often multi-day canoe or kayak excursions. And so um, the fact that the town is uh, just kind of a cute upper Midwest Main Street kind of works because there isn't the expectation that people are going out for the day and staying in town. And so that's what's different about the valley is that most of the trips in the valley, the kind of ecotourism trips are four hours on the water, a five hour hike through the forest, all those kinds of things. But you probably are not camping, you're coming back into town. So like it's a different market we're trying to serve. We're trying to get people to stay multiple days in the valley. So, so how do we compete? How do we look? So, you know, our nature on the left, you know, the hiking trails and the roads and, and, the, and the Cuyahoga River itself, second to none, gorgeous. Our built environment compared to the competition, disaster. We, we cannot compete. And I'll just say when, when, you're, when your natural features are kind of on flat land, it puts an extra burden on your built environment to sort of carry it, right? And so to go back, like these are like the nature's an A, the built environment an A here, the nature's an A, but less visible built environment D minus or whatever. So uh, anyway, to be a gateway, we have some work to do. So that's, that's gateway and poses that question. So 
Second one is corridors. So where people and nature can both thrive. So, so the first idea that we're introducing here is something we're calling nature corridors. And by that, we mean, um, you know, habitats, you know, the, the land gives you cues and, and, and I'll shift to this. The land gives you cues. There are uh, actual rivers or streams. Sometimes they're rivulets, sometimes they're creeks, but there are fingers of water through that run across the landscape, across private and public land, across property lines, the whole thing. And so this isn't how we in America develop land. This is how nature thrives. So this map um, is in some ways kind of oblivious to what land it's passing over. And it needs to be because nature doesn't doesn't know, the fish doesn't know whose property it's swimming on, that sort of thing. So, so these fingers of nature, we've done our best um, at a planner level to sort of say, we think these are defensible habitat corridors. So step one, to implement this plan, we say hire a naturalist, do more rigorous mapping, confirm that these things are, are, are where they should be, um, and then map them accordingly and act, act on them. And so the notion here is that if, if this plan were implemented, even on private property, when the negotiation happens about where development takes place on private property, efforts would be made to protect these, these corridors that private developers would be discouraged from filling in a creek and putting it in a pipe, for example, or, and they would be discouraged from clear cutting uh, trees and so on to, uh, to prepare for development. So, so that is sort of step number one, the habitat corridor. And it's a nice idea until you realize you're a deer or you're a rabbit or you're, a, you know, whatever. And there are streets and roads and your, your fate is to be roadkill. So, so integral to the idea of the habitat quarters are what, what we're calling here critter crossings, <coughs> excuse me, critter crossings, which are more or less grade separated ways for for uh, nature corridors, nature paths, could also be multi-purpose human trails to pass either below or above a road so that all of these habitat corridors don't end up in roadkill you know, nodes right where they cross the major streets. So that's nature corridors. We have a, we propose a second type of corridor, which is a scenic byway. And so you can see here these sort of longer, longer green stretches along the main roads there are the kind of the key for the scenic byway, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. So this, this, the first, the idea of the nature quarters is in some ways for the benefit of nature, but we also see, to go back, we see there an opportunity to be multi-purpose trails along these. They could be conceivably hiking trails, biking trails, and that sort of thing, so that they have a nature focus with a human benefit. Um, this, the scenic byway um, kind of setbacks and so on are really meant to preserve the experience. I think many, many people have talked to us about when we were there and certainly been listening. When you drive through the valley, if it just feels great, like you're in nature, you descend, the river sort of over here, um, and it's that kind of experience, you know, in some ways for the driver, but it's not trivial, it's important to do. And so this is a, this is a, a kind of a second a corridor layer. And so we did these sketches to kind of jumpstart the conversation here to say, we're imagining that there would be a 100 foot um, scenic setback on both sides of the street. Now there's a lot of existing development we can talk about, but just in the ideal circumstance, you could do the setback as a meadow where you see, you're seeing kind of uh, a non-mowed meadow, by the way, and that is probably the biggest uh, change here, because I think there are a lot of, of, you know, building owners and landowners who are very mindful of maintaining the look and feel of their property, and the first thing they do is mow, and so uh, mow is not part of nature, it's part of, you know, settlements so, or part of suburbs, so, so this may take some, uh, you know, rethinking and people sort of saying, well, that looks kind of messy to me, like I'd rather mow it. Well, one of the tricks you can do is if you mow at the edge, you can let the first 10 or 15 feet can be mowed and then the rest of it can go to nature and people like that. They like the combination of trimmed, you know, plus, plus natural. So sometimes it'll work well as a meadow, particularly if there's more open space behind the meadow. If there's development behind it, we might recommend 
more of a, a forest buffer. But in, a, in either case, you know, here's the roadway, here's a multi-purpose trail, and there's the 100 feet. So, so that's, that's the second proposal. So if this were adopted for undeveloped land, um, you know, you'd have some scenic buffer and the development would take place behind it. For existing developed land, you know, we're talking about a kind of a pilot program to work with existing building owners and landowners to see, uh, you know, to demonstrate how to beautifully naturalize their frontages, okay? So that's that. So this, the first layer was the image of the gateway, second is corridor, third, now we're talking about conservation neighborhoods. And this is, this is probably the hardest part for this plan for us or forces us to sort of innovate more than we have before. We bring a lot of, you know, thought and um, authorship and, and so on to this topic, but nonetheless, this kind of forces us to stretch. So conservation neighborhoods as mapped here and there, are, I think six of them are more or less um, the only, uh, the remaining undeveloped private land. Uh, in the valley. So you can see all of these things that we have not put boxes around are already developed, already developed, already developed, all that kind of stuff. So this is the stuff that's, that uh, who's, you know, that lots of folks are concerned how it's going to go. Is it going to be another, you know, golf course development you didn't favor or, or what? So, so there is not a silver bullet for these, but what we're proposing is this, that this is, um, the punchline is buried here. It's an all hands on deck and all of the above. So, so there's a role for land conservancy. There's a role for the cities. And actually there's a role for private developers for this to all come together and work as a framework. So the first one is land conservancy. I'm gonna go back one map, one map and say, the, the development, the viability of each of these areas to be developed has everything to do with, do they have access to the road? If they don't have access to the road, it's not going to be developed because you know you can't get a permit, you can't get emergency vehicles in there, you can't get the users on and off it. And so, so the land conservancy could play a role, as it does in many, as other conservancies do in other places, to buy strategic parcels or to buy development frontages. And so, some of this may be already developed land. And you say, why is a nature conservancy buying like a, you know, an auto shop or something like that? Well, the auto shop, uh, if it were to change hands frees up the development of the 30 acres behind it, right? So you find yourself like you're not buying pristine, you know, uh, woodlands or so on, you're buying land strategically. So, so this is a kind of thinking, this is a, an idea stolen from other uh, kind of fast growing um, areas where you want to conserve land. So, you know, land conservancy, um, get out there and, and do that. So second one is the cities and there, there are two and we have a great coding consultant, Leon Swiler, who has already started working with them and talking how they can talk about how they can synchronize their standards. But basically the steps for the cities are adopt this plan, revise their subdivision regulations to promote what I'll talk about in a minute, bike oriented development, stormwater, dark sky, all of the kind of high performance elements of sustainable neighborhoods or conservation neighborhoods. So, you know, get the rules right. And we talked about that and that was part of the listening up front. And then private developers, and this is, I hope, I hope there's a bunch of you on the call tonight. We met with a bunch of people uh, during the charrette and people were really eager to kind of roll up their sleeves and kind of do better. You know, everyone loves the Valley. No one wants to think they were the person that screwed it up. Um, but um, in terms of the gene pool of develop, development expertise in the Valley, um, we did not encounter um, the kind of world-class aspiration that the vision of this plan imagines. And so, so that may involve, you know, buying books, may involve travel, it may involve, you know, looking at different case studies from other places, and above all, just educating one another and setting a high bar. And so uh, it, it is best, it is best, and the best places that turn out well, that fulfill this vision, it's not because the, the city's got a big stick and is beating you up and fixing your plans when you don't care when you submit them and they're sort of not that thoughtful, it's because both sides are trying. And so through a partnership. So I just, it is a request and kind of a, an opening to the developers to say, bring forward your best stuff. You know, maybe don't hire the same civil engineer that just carved up three subdivisions for you. You know, get a guy from Cleveland, get a guy from, you know, wherever, uh, Atlanta, Chicago, whatever, 
uh, that is known for these things and bring forward some, some new ideas, some innovations. That's what we talked about. So, so uh, it's a partnership, land conservation, public entities, private entities, okay? So, and so here is what we're kind of proposing as kind of the regulatory part of this. This would be the sort of city vision. So this is, a, this is the sort of same road in all three circumstances. This is kind of what you get in the absence of planning. There's the road, all of the parcels along it get subdivided chunka, chunka, chunka. They all get their own driveways. Occasionally there's a breakthrough um, and that becomes some sort of you know, tree-shaped cul-de-sac development and then some land is left over in the back, right? So, so that's sprawl. And what's characteristic of it is that every um, trip to and from it is a car trip. And every trip to and from, every car trip has to go on the main road. And those two cul-de-sac points there are pinch points for left turns and right turns. They become kind of the treacherous gun it to get across traffic kind of thing, or you'll die. So this is, this is Americans default plan across the country and, and the Valley has more than its share. So, so for your consideration, we want to kind of 25 years ago, we would have said, do this. And some people still say, do this. And it's, it's better than this, which is let's institute those scenic byways. So along both sides of the street. So there's a bit of nature, you know, a layer of trees before the development. And then this is what's called cluster development, where you basically the emphasis on get it away from the roads so that as I'm motoring through the valley, I can't see it, right? So that's kind of cluster development. It's, uh, it's got lots of different names. Um, but anyway, oftentimes those cluster developments don't touch. And so what was one of the critiques here was that every trip is a car trip back on the road, same deal. So this guy, you can't get to there. You have to go back out there, back out there and come back up. So, so what we're proposing is what we're briefly calling connected development. Like, Yes, put the conservation, the scenic byways in place, yet ha yes, have those uh, kind of limited sort of access points, but then connect them in back so that a, a car trip or a bike trip, you know, what would be a car trip here might actually become a walk trip or a bike trip. So you're actually reducing trips when you connect land uses. So hopefully that kind of one, two, three uh, makes some sense. So, so the way we're proposing this, and this was how I'm hoping that the subdivision regulations and incentives can be written, goes something like this. So along, this is a kind of detail of the master plan, along all of the roadways, we are proposing a, an adjacent parallel multi-purpose path, which would include bikes, you know, which would accommodate bikes, excuse me. <clears throat> and so we're calling this bike-friendly or bike-oriented development, we're reluctant to call it bike-oriented because it's spells out a, a, you know, some, uh, an acronym that teenagers giggle at. So, but anyway, here's the, here's the bike, bike trail. And so here's that bike trail. So here's the road, bike trail. And so rather than every trip into town is yet a car trip and there are fewer of them because it's connected, could be you can take bike instead of car and that that's made viable and there's an investment made in that. And you say, gee, that sounds like Europe and that doesn't work in America or something like that. So, but I would commend to you, this is, you know, further to kind of educating ourselves about what the choices are out there. Davis, California, Village Homes in Davis, California does exactly this. Every house has a kind of a front for the car and a back for the bike, uh, and it's beautiful. And kids can ride miles and miles without ever crossing a road. So, so that is bike-oriented development is what we're kind of proposing there. Um, when you get into the development itself, where there's a kind of neighborhood development, we highlight these sort of five elements um, that come out of sustainable urbanism and so on. Um, you know, design buildings to a higher standard. This is um, those of you who are following the climate emergency. This is kind of a mandate. Um, buildings use you know about a third of the carbon in the country. So uh, new buildings could be all electric, super energy efficient, renewably powered with solar panels. If you go on our company's website, you'll see some examples of that. Um, every neighborhood should have a walk to civic space in the center of it. You know, when um, the, you know, uh, the sports team in Cleveland wins the, wins the series, you and you want to have a party, you shouldn't have to ask where are we meeting, you just go there and you know that's where everyone's going to be. Um, Stormwater, we want it to infiltrate naturally rather than put it in a pipe and ship it across town and make it a waste product, have it fall on the ground, re-infiltrate on site. This has been kind of the norm 
in uh, good development circles for about a generation. Uh, maintain tree canopies, they take 100 years to come back. So, uh, and then where possible promote natives. Um, and then dark sky, which is, a, which is really appropriate for the Cuyahoga Valley. If you haven't heard it, there's a whole movement called the dark sky movement started in the Southwest where they have wide open spaces and oftentimes have observatories up on mountains and they're, the astronomers are doing science there. And so as the, as the development happens and they put thoughtlessly put floodlights that aim at the night sky, they can't see stars anymore. And so they figured out that they can have development and dark skies. And it's gorgeous. When you step out of your house, you're like, wow, there's a Milky Way. It's all there for me. You could lose that. So that your regulations going forward need to think about dark sky. So a walkable street grid, I've sort of referred to this um, before, but this diagram kind of encompasses it. So this diagonal line, it's just a diagram, but this diagonal line sort of separates how sprawl, how development has taken place over the second, um, um, since Second World War, and um, and then sort of the more walkable thing where the streets are connected. Um, every trip here, as I said, is a trip back on the arterial. Every trip here can be an internal trip. So that's what we want to do. Um, and then a mix of housing types. So the market study prepared by Land Use USA, Sharon Wood, showed that there's a lot of interest in being in the Valley to live here. Um, and there's a lot of multifamily, but there's lots of opportunities for a range of housing types. So I'll just leave it at that. This is this, this uh, diagram here is called the missing middle housing. So it's everything between a single family house and an apartment building, two flats, three flats, six flats, courtyard buildings, townhouses, the whole thing are, are uh, well suited to America's needs. So the two nodes are awesome. So start with the valley. So it's this part of the site. And so we have a kind of word, word picture that describes these. Um, and we're calling this one, thanks for the memory. So today a visit to the Merriman Valley le leaves no lasting impression. Part of what makes this place special, especially in our social media age, is having a memorable image, a postcard view, like the Tetons, like the Rockies. To promote ecotourism and serve as the gateway to the national park, this plan proposes a massive piece of conceptual art, the world's largest interactive canoe. So I start with this to say, I wanna put you in the mindset of innovation and trying things that haven't been tried before and competing nationally with the Rocky Mountains and the Tetons. What is it we have that will draw people and get them to stay here in the Valley? So to orient you, here's node A at the intersection of Merriman Road and Portage Path. And here's the Cuyahoga River. I think you know it pretty well. Uh, the train tracks are right here. Um, and uh, we're going to now zero in on a few projects. So, so again, same streets um, here's, but I'm going to talk you through a few projects that I'm going to illustrate in 3D rendering. So the first one is called the Civic Green. If you have ever driven at this intersection, it's a mess. It's a place you would uh, take your life into your hands to cross. And ironically, it's this very point that was the point of portage. So try and carry a canoe across that intersection, you know, you, you, you won't end up uh, at the other side with the canoe intact, right? So, so the civic green is proposed here as, a, as both a civic space, um, you'll see pictures of it in a second, um, and um, Sid, I'm, I see your notes, I'm gonna keep moving, thank you. Um, Anyway, uh, that's it. Uh, so Civic Green, we'll talk about that. The, the uh, River Edge Trail, um, this is the Riverbend Park there. Um, the train station, the slip lane and the train platform and the flat iron building. So let me just take you to, um, uh, you know, illustrations of all these things. So the town green um, is more or less an elongated roundabout and folks have round Roundabouts, I know in, in Akron, I believe they're in Cuyahoga Valley as well. So a roundabout can be elastic, it can be kidney shaped, it can be um, uh, lozenge shaped, all that sort of stuff. So you'll see how that goes. So here's, here's that aerial view. So here's our two big streets, right? And so here's that big sort of civic green. So if you were tra traveling in a car here, you would travel and go make a right turn there. If you're, whoops, if you were going the other way, you travel and make a left turn there. And so it's a free flowing, like, like all, all traffic circles, it's a free flowing intersection done right. You don't need signals. So, and then you, but you do need these splitter islands. 
What this allows us to do is to get safe passage for pedestrians to get from the development on this side to the river edge on that side. So I'm gonna just point out a few other elements and you'll, these will be posted afterwards. So the Civic Green, there's the, the canoe we'll talk about in a minute. We describe this as the Flatiron site. If those of you who have been to New York City are familiar with the Flatiron building in Greenwich, uh, in Union Square in New York, it's kind of comes to a point like a sharp slice of pie. The scenic railway comes in here and you can see here it is illustrated. And so we're proposing a kind of uh, platform that you could, you know, uh, embark and disembark there and then a train station, right? You can see this little tower element there. Train station would sort of anchor, uh, anchor that sort of uh, uh, scenic railroad destination. So we could actually imagine people taking the train from Cleveland and other points, staying overnight, doing some kayak, doing some hiking, go back a couple of days later. So that is ecotourism. So, and then other elements you'll see in a minute, uh, Riverbend Park. Um, these are major redevelopments of many of the buildings along here to go from strip malls, which are set back uh, from the street with parking lots in front to the building at the sidewalk where you can connect all the pedestrians. So, so here is a view. Um, I remember I pointed out that train station there down at the end. So that's the sort of terminal vista, the kind of uh, tower that marks the train station. Here's a, a scene imagining a major redevelopment of many of those buildings being built closer to the street, going from one story buildings to two, maybe three story buildings. I think three stories is okay uh, for this area. So that's what you're seeing here, three stories. And here is that canoe. So this idea of a 300 foot long canoe that could be a multi-purpose space, could have yoga classes, it could have concerts, uh, it could have you know kids activities, uh, whatever, but it's the world's largest canoe. So whether the project succeeds in building the canoe or not, what, what I'd like to leave you with is this idea of like, wow, if you, you know, we started with the premise that says there's nothing that when you go to the valley, it's nice, but is it memorable? This would be uniquely memorable. So, um, so that's something to consider. Um, and then um, Riverbend Park, we'll talk about that in a second. We're going to turn that into a destination. So, so again, here is that Riverbend Park. And the thought there is there's a little building there. This would be a redevelopment of some of the strip malls there. And so this could be an amphitheater kind of gathering space that spills out to the water's edge. It could be a kayak dock. Uh, and then a, we're proposing to continue. This is already the, the towpath trail and then continue it along uh, the river's edge there. So you'll see these detail, these uh, drawings um, afterwards. Um, and then second one is no B, the Northampton corner intersection. And so. Again, this one's in Cuyahoga Valley, it's right there. Um, and here's our kind of spoken thing. Um, access to Northampton Corners is via a scenic byway. The continuous landscape setback, the, the scenic byway setback will, as you enter it, will recede and the buildings will become more prominent. In the distance, a pair of 50 foot tall oars located on both sides of the roads will suggest passing through the large conceptual art canoe in the valley. So, if you get to the conceptual art, you've won the global prize. If you don't get there, it's something to aspire to. I think it could really make quite a difference. So here we are at the node, just to orient you, this is Portage Trail Extension West and Northampton Road here. There's an existing gas station there. There's a carpet store. There's a kind of former pizza spot. Um, I think you all know the intersection. So, so here is sort of zeroed in on that node, a few projects that I'm gonna highlight. So the gas station itself, um, gas stations are really tough. They're profitable. They never want to give up their land. But if you give them an option to um, add development or commercial uh, uh, outlots, that can really make things more profitable and make things more walkable for us. The yellow dash lines are the bike trails that you know connect along the big street. Big idea here is four walkable corners surrounded by three walkable neighborhoods and a perimeter street. So I'll show you that from the air. Um, hopefully this makes sense. So here's that sort of uh, big carpet uh, off building. Here's the gas station with its canopy with a new kind of corner commercial, commercial um, outbuilding. And then you can see here three new developments on all three corners that are two and three story uh, mixed use developments. Uh, they'd have some commercial on, on the hard corners um, and then likely housing on the upper floors, but you know, could be some 
housing occasionally on the ground floor. So, so hopefully this is making sense. And what we're trying to do here is write, you know, one of the pictures we showed about the current state of Cuyahoga Valley was this very intersection. It's blown out. It's anywhere sprawl America. It's nothing special. And it's your gateway into the valley. So what we're trying to do is to pinch this intersection and have the buildings really lean in and face them in a very walkable way. So you can see we've even decorated the intersection with a kind of yin yang uh, uh, a thing that, that is um, inspired by the waves of a river. So, and here's looking at it the other way, this is the gas station outbuilding in the foreground and our three other buildings in the background. So this would, this would ask that the architecture of these buildings face the street and you know, project to the extent that they can, okay? And so there are precedents for doing gas stations this way. Here's an illustration of that. Leave it, leave it for you to absorb that. Um, and then this image is talking about back up in the conservation neighborhoods. When we have those meandering um, natural corridors, the development that faces it can look like a lot of different things. It could certainly be single family housing, but it could also be uh, multifamily housing. It has kind of a rural or a barn character or uh, you know, could be, take a lot of forms. But anyway, the idea is that there's a development facing a permanent public nature corridor. And then finally, this is a preview of what's gonna happen starting in January with, under Lee Einsweiler's guidance. So zoning, you know, there's planning, which is what we're doing today. And then there's zoning, which is setting the rules, zoning and subdivision. And simple way to think about it. You take a parcel of land, what the plan does is says, we, just as I've shown you, we see this corner as being, you know, uh, mixed use, this corner is multifamily, this corner is townhouses, that's our vision in the plan. And then it gets handed to the, to the code, the zone code writers, and they develop a code that allows that parcel, if we have three characters in mind, to build out in phases over time. So phase one, the townhouses are built, phase two, the building gets replaced with, with other mixed use buildings, for example, and at the end of it all, what was not beautiful becomes a beautiful walkable place because the plan and the zoning worked together. And this is what the zoning code might just look like. So I'll leave it at that. I think we're at the end and I'm gonna call on Dan to um, take over. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much, Doug, um, for that very thorough uh, presentation. Um, it was very informative and uh, based on the uh, feedback already, uh, some folks have actually already shared, you know, some comments um, in the uh, Q&A box. And so that's really what I'd like to just um, do right now is just remind people for those folks who may have joined us late. Um, this is really the most important part of the presentation. This is where you all get an opportunity to provide us with questions regarding the material that Mr. Doug Farr um, presented regarding the Miraman Valley uh, Master Plan. And so the way you do that is down at the bottom of your screen, there is a little icon that says q and A it has some, kind of some uh, thought bubbles or kind of uh, you know icons there. So you click on that and just add you know your question in there. Um, we've already had a number of questions and the way the process will go is uh, I will do my very best to capture the essence of the questions. Um, if there's some kind of similar questions, I'll try to group them together. Um, and we'll do our very best to try to answer as many questions as possible, if not all of the questions. Um, and then also I will call on Mr. Segedy, uh, Ms. Colvecchio, and Mr. Farr to answer those questions. And so now that's why they're kind of populating the screen there and certainly Mayor Walters and Mayor Horrigan to the degree that you would be interested in, in joining in the conversation as well. And uh, Lee Ensweiler and other members of the FAR team. So that's how the process will go. Um, and I'm gonna kick it off. Um, because we've already, like I said, had a number of really good questions already. Uh, one of the questions that came up early on was, um, who is seeking development? Who is seeking to develop in the Miraman Valley? And I, 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 my gut instinct is that probably would go to Mr. Segedy and Ms. Colvecchio, because you are in, in most contact um, with potential developers. Um, and as a member of the Planning Commission, I know we get interest in inquiries all the time. So, uh, you know, Ms. Colvecchio, do you want to take that question first, and then Mr. Segedy? Sure. Thank you. And thank you uh, for the, the insightful question, because that's the whole reason we're here, right, is to talk about how we're going to develop it. And it, but it does beg the, the, the question, 
why, who's asking? Well, the, the askers are the landowners. And in, in the situation of Cuyahoga Falls, I can speak directly to the fact that we have two prominent landowners in the area of the Four Corners, the part that we're talking about that is the intersection of Portage Trail Extension and Northampton Road. Two landowners opposite sides of those Four Corners have uh, uh, quite a bit of combined acreage and have been coming to our department at City Hall asking to develop those acreage, their, their acreage. And we have been sort of putting them off pending the outcome of this plan because it's gonna drastically shape what they can put on their acreage and how they can put it there and what it's gonna look like. So that, uh, that request is uh, based on their rights as landowners to use their land, profit from their land. We cannot restrict their rights to that land. If we do, we run into dangerous territory here of being uh, uh, overstepping, possibly committing some legal, some issues for the city and that uh, we would be accused of, you know, interfering to the point where we could be sued and the landowners could say that we're taking their property from them. So to avoid that, we have asked them to be patient to, to stand with us, stand by us and be on board. When we have this draft plan completed, we're gonna share this, these slides with them and then certainly get their input when we get to the zoning part here uh, because we do need them to have some buy-in as, as to what happens here because it's gonna affect their lives. It's gonna affect their pocketbooks as well. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Ms. Kolbuck. Mr. Segedy? Yeah, I would just add, um, you know, I think one reason we're really excited about this plan and we like the framework that FAR and Associates put together is, I think as everybody saw in the presentation, we've got one node in the city of Akron that, uh, I'm going to generalize a little bit, is largely all developed. And then we have another node in Cuyahoga Falls that a lot of it is undeveloped. And I think both of those nodes speak to the, uh, you know, the two, the dynamic in the valley where we've got some older buildings that, you know, the issue is more redevelopment and how would they be redeveloped if they're torn down or renovated in the future versus uh, vacant land that there's nothing built on right now. And I think that's where, you know, to me, the zoning code part of this that Doug mentioned that's going to happen in the first quarter of 2022 is so important because, uh, and just to reiterate, and I know Doug did a great job of sharing this at the charrette, but in the United States of America, property owners have the right to develop their property. And where zoning comes in is it does have stipulations as to how they can develop that property. So I think with our zoning codes and why I think the zoning is the most important part of this is A, the zoning can regulate the use. So it might say you can have that as single family residential, but you can't have it as industrial or commercial. And then number two, and I think this is where we really have the opportunity with this plan, is that the zoning can uh, dictate the form of the building. So I know what Lee's working on and what we'll be working with him on over the next couple months is what's called a form-based code. And so that zoning code in particular cares about the form of the buildings, like how the architecture of the buildings looks, uh, everything from like what material is that building built out of to how many windows does it have? And then it also, which I think is even more important, addresses like how does that building address the street? Is that building able to be set back 50 feet from the curb with parking uh, in the front of it? Or is that building required to be placed up near the curb with the parking in the back. And I think that really affects how the valley looks and feels, how traffic operates and so forth. And so I, I do think just, you know, just to be clear, I think the zoning, there's no zoning category for either city that says thou shalt not develop your land. That's not really on the table, but what we do have the opportunity to do is to have, you know, regulations that, that guide the development that, that actually can be quite strict in some respects, but in other respects can enable a property owner to get, you know, some economic benefit, but also have a neighborhood that looks great and feels great. I think in the end, that's really what we're going for here. Super. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I will apologize in advance to, you know, our, our audience, or I don't know if you can see the video, but I'm frantically trying to read and make notes and listen and everything. So it's not that I'm not paying attention to the answers. I'm just trying to 
do things uh, at the same time. And ironically enough, well, uh, Ms. Colvecchio and Mr. Segedi were answering that question. Another question kind of came up that I think is related. And that is how much of the, uh, this new Merriman Valley Master Plan can be developed without the cooperation of private landowners? Um, I think that's a really good question. And, and, and I guess I'm gonna kick it back to uh, Ms. Colvecchio and Mr. Segedi. Although Mr. Segedi, you wanna take the lead first since Ms. Colvecchio took the lead the last time. Sure, and I'll be brief because I felt like I got a little bit long there, but um, and I think the private property owners are instrumental. I mean, when new zoning, if and when new zoning is adopted, uh, it will have certain stipulations in order for a private property owner to deviate from those stipulations. They're going to have to come before our planning commission and our city council to ask for a variance or conditional use. And so uh, while the zoning is important, I think we, we very much want to work with pro private property owners and to get like a shared vision and a shared understanding. Because I, I think the one of the biggest issues, especially in that uh, the area Doug showed first along Merriman Road, I'll just use that as an example because it's mostly in Akron, is I think in a perfect world, that area could look so much more like a town. And, you know, like Doug said, it could be areas where people could walk perhaps for certain trips. I don't think we're under any illusions people are gonna walk two miles from their house to a business in the Valley. But as he mentioned, I mean, something as simple as just crossing Merriman Road. I mean, I think we did it the first time that Doug and his team came to town and it was not uh, all that pleasant of an experience. And so getting that to work better. But I do think, you know, the private property owners are key. We want people to uh, you know, we want to work with them, we want them to work with us, and we want to develop a shared vision for how this could, this area could function like a neighborhood or a village or a town versus just kind of a sprawling mess of disconnected uh, buildings, which I think is largely how it uh, functions right now. And I think even the current property owners, I think if we all had a chance to do it over again, would, would want something a little bit better than what's there right now. Thank you, Mr. Segedi. Ms. Colvecchio? Uh, the only other thing I'll add is, I think because the question's asking how much cooperation do we need from the landowners, we, do, we, we need their cooperation, as Jason aptly pointed out, but uh, we would not need the cooperation, for example, of the, I mean, of the land that is not owned by people other than us. For example, the city owns seven some acres on um, Portage Path. So in that case, we would be looking to develop it uh, in conformity with our new plan and our code. But again, since there's no landowner involved, we're not seeking any other outside cooperation. Sounds good, thank you very much. And there, as you can imagine, there are a lot of questions regarding the code. So I'm gonna try to uh, you know, kind of lump them together, although we do have a lot of questions still in the Q&A to come here. But uh, one of our earlier questions was, will the meadow buffer idea require a code change? And I think that's probably as to Mr. Farr um, I think I know the answer to that, but I, I think I'd rather defer to the expert here. Dan, could you repeat the question? Sorry. The question was, will the, this meadow buffer idea require a code change in both of the city's uh, development codes? Uh, I'm going to defer to Lee Einsweiler. So, the, you know, we're responsible for the plan. The plan would say this is a good idea, adopt this plan. And then uh, I would defer to him on how he would write it. The problem, it, it to have teeth, it would have to be some sort of rule. So I'm going to say probably yes. That's what I thought. Lee, is there anything else you wanted to add? <clears throat> no, I'm just going to say yes. It would require a code change for both municipalities. That's what I thought. Another question uh, came up. Will Akron and Cauga Falls also be looking at their commercial codes to make sure any expansion renovation is being done with the surrounding environment in mind? And again, I think I would go back to Mr. Segedi and Ms. Colvecchio, although I think... It's your turn, Ms. Colvecchio, to be up first. Well, the answer is yes. I mean, we're mindful that we're not just talking about residential development here. It's the commercial component goes, we're talking probably mostly about redevelopment. Uh, I, I think in particular about that gasoline station on the northwest corner there of Portage Trail and Mr. Farr's suggestion that we see find a way to maybe incentivize them to rebuild that, put, kick it back off of the the street line so that they can add some other nicer feature up front. So that would be redevelopment of the commercial aspect. And absolutely, we want to uh, have some, some things in the code that would address that. 
Mr. Segeti? Sure, and I would just add that, yeah, yeah, absolutely, that's part of it as well. And I think in addition to the form-based code work that I mentioned earlier that, that focuses more on the built environment and how buildings interact with uh, the area around them and interact with, the, uh, with their own site, uh, there is still a land use part to it. And what, what I mean by that is that I think part of Lee's work and working with both communities is going to be to look at, are there areas that are zoned you know, commercial right now or were zoned industrial that maybe that made sense in 1964, but it doesn't necessarily make that much sense for the Valley today. And so we will look be looking at having zoning that may change that. I think it's important for attendees. I mean, many of you might realize this, but uh, existing developments are what we call grandfathered in. So if there's an existing built uh, a building or business, if we change the zoning, that business doesn't have to conform to that zoning. It's when that business is, you know, the building is torn down or it changes use, that's where we have an opportunity to have the new zoning kick in. And I know Doug mentioned this earlier in his presentation, but, and I, I hope to be around for uh, some of this, but, but this is a long, potentially a long haul. I mean, this is everything I think you'll see in this draft plan, things that could be implemented next year to things that could be implemented long after I'll be gone. And hopefully there'll be a lot that are in between. But um, I, I think with planning, it is important to realize that uh, you know, we have a whole gamut of opportunities that range from really short term to medium to long term. Sounds good. Um, another question, um, I think, you know, kind of in the same vein is, um, does FAR recommend the city of Akron, City of Cuyahoga Falls remove tax abatements for new development? Um, I think I'm going to kick that to Mr. FAR. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to kick it back to each of the towns. So, um, you know, we embrace what the what the survey taught us, which is um, there's interest, particularly in redevelopment, to adopt the right rules and then provide incentives. And so, I think the incentives uh, need to be dialed in and focus on redevelopment more so than greenfield. But that's that's a policy choice by the two towns. So that'll be a recommendation: focus on redevelopment. Anything further, uh, Ms. Colbecchio, Mr. Segeti, you'd like to add to that? Uh, maybe I'll start on this one and then kick it over to Diana if she has anything to add. But uh, given that Akron has a current citywide 15 year, 100% property tax abatement, I think as many people who are here realize that uh, tax abatement program was launched back in 2017 and the intent was to try to turn around the housing market in a city that's lost 100,000 people since 1960. So uh, this city that I was born in, that I love, has lost a third of its population since 1960. Uh, Mayor Horrigan felt very strongly that we need, you know, if, we, if the thing we've been doing for 50 or 60 years hasn't worked, we need to change direction and do something different. And the tax abatement, has been utilized throughout the city, downtown and outlying neighborhoods as well with different types of housing. I definitely understand where people are coming from when they ask about uh, a, a new development on a green field in the Merriman Valley. Uh, I would be the first to admit, I'd love to see all of the new housing in Akron be infill housing in the core of the city, but we also have to be pragmatic and look at how we can attract new residents to Akron that can patronize our businesses, can work in our city, can pay taxes, et cetera. Uh, we haven't made any decisions to change the footprint of the tax abatement program. What I can say, and I think a big opportunity in the Valley, and sometimes people forget this, is a lot of the land in Akron in the, in the footprint of this planning study is already developed. And so if people want to uh, tear down, say, a retail strip mall and build new apartments or take existing apartments that have outlived their useful life and build, uh, for lack of a better word, better apartments, the tax abatement equally applies to those. So the tax abatement isn't just there for uh, new construction on greenfields. It's there for buildings that are torn down and rebuilt. It's also there for renovation of existing buildings. So I think it would be it would be premature and abrupt to just say 
the tax abatement doesn't or shouldn't apply in the Merriman Valley. I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Ms. Nicole Vecchio, anything you'd like to add? Well, I think everyone knows Cuyahoga Falls does not have a residential tax abatement program in the Valley, but I will say that we are very open to having discussions about a tax increment financing uh, sort of mechanism in place, a TIF, to incentivize a development or redevelopment of a commercial space down there, something that would perhaps be uh, similar to what we've just recently passed by city council on Monday night, where we're gonna redevelop South Front Street with a TIF and it's a non-school TIF. So it makes the schools whole. Uh, in fact, in that case, we're gonna make the library whole as well and still get the kind of um, you know uh, infrastructure built on South Front Street that we're, we're looking to, to do to improve that area and that corridor. So this area is ripe for that. I think to, to incentivize the landowners or the commercial landowners to do the kind of things we'd love them to do so that when we look at these renderings, we see these things start to pop out of the ground and come to life. Uh, absolutely, I think a TIF is probably something we're gonna be looking at. Okay, super. And really kind of along those lines, um, there was a very thoughtful question that was asked, um, has there been really any discussion regarding affordable housing? Um, because we know that when you have that mixture of housing, um, you truly do get social economic mixing, um, which is really good for communities. So um, I, I guess, uh, who, you know, again, I'm going to probably kick it to uh, this quote. Well, it looks like Mr. Farr wants to uh, you know, take the lead on that. So feel free to go ahead. I'll, I'll just say a sentence and keep it brief. So that that missing middle housing is the is a way that the private sector can best meet the different needs of different family types across the country. So, you know, a lot of people don't need a big yard, don't need two car garage, don't need all that sort of stuff. So they're they're asked to pay for things that they their family doesn't need. So, uh, oftentimes the zoning and the regulations make it hard to do those sort of unique units or smaller units. So, uh, so I think through the coding process, we can actually deliver without subsidy just what the private sector you know might like to build and and do so properly, but it will be more affordable because it gets rid of the bells and whistles that families don't need. Gotcha. Uh, Ms. Colvecchio, Mr. Segedi, any comments you'd like to build on that? I could, I could tell you that the uh, district that we're talking about here is not a low mod income district. So we will never be able to use HUD money there through our CDBG entitlement program to do any kind of housing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that a project might not come forward to us that we wouldn't use those kinds of funds for. So it's, it's hard to say. Um, you know, I think one of the issues in this whole planning process has been that we really haven't heard much from the residents who already live in apartments down in the valley, and we'd hope that some of them are on this call tonight and are going to weigh in on the survey that's going to come out after this. So, um, unfortunately, we're not getting any kind of feedback, real feedback, that's been useful for us about uh, the plan with respect to people who live in apartments, period, let alone affordable housing. So that, that's really all my comments, uh, I guess, to be continued. We'll see what happens as uh, as we proceed. Sounds good, Mr. Secretary. And I'd add that I think, uh, you know, especially for those that are familiar with the city of Akron, uh, if I have my numbers correct, over 70% of the housing units in the city of Akron are single family detached housing. Uh, many of those are owner occupied, over 50% of the housing in the city of Akron is owner occupied. In the Valley, 84%, if I remember the number correctly, uh, are renter occupied housing. And I think one of the great successes, although if I had a magic wand and I could decide exactly what every building in the Valley looked like, it's probably fair to say I wouldn't have them look like they do right now. I think one great thing about the Valley is it does have a diversity of housing types. There are many apartments in the Valley. In fact, the vast majority of people rent that live in the Valley. Uh, and those rents, you know, they, they run the gamut. There are some that are lower income units at the uh, Waterford on Portage Trail. There are some that are higher income. There are many that are middle of the road. I actually think you would find there is a great diversity of rental opportunity in the Valley already. And I think the goal going forward should be to, to keep that that way and to build upon that uh, and to provide, like Doug had said earlier in his presentation, opportunities for different types of housing. Because although the, the form, the urban form, I'm gonna use planner speak, uh, could be a lot better in the Valley. I think the diversity of 
people that live there and the types of housing available is actually far better than in a lot of the rest of Summit County. And I think that's something to build upon. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much for that thoughtful response. Um, we have a kind of a, con well, we have several conservation questions. So I'm gonna try to lump those together actually. Uh, this question came um, from a very thoughtful participant. How much the existing forest would be preserved versus developed? I'm not sure if we know really the answer to that. Um, but I, I think obviously there's a conservation ethic that's kind of part of the plan. Is that, is that safe to say, Mr. Farr? That is true. We, uh, Dan, and to the questioner, we don't have a great accuracy in terms of what's possible, you know, uh, in terms of what percentage of land might be conserved. Um, you know, I think that next year during the, the coding process, Lee will lead the, lead the process and um, has worked across the country with developers to figure out how, when they are developing, how much open space um, uh, uh, an ordinance can reasonably expect to require a developer to provide. And so what our plan does is, is to say, whatever that number is, first put it in the bucket that is a conservation corridor, second put it in the bucket that's the scenic byway, and then, then pass that. So it is a kind of prioritization of, of uh, what, uh, what the regulations can ask of a private developer. So, so we did not prepare calculations because you can see it's a, it's a negotiation process, but the division, if, if the plan I showed you was implemented as you know, all those quarters were built out, it would be dozens and dozens, you know, dare, dare I say, uh, you know, 100 acres of 1,000 would be, you know, conserved. So a lot. Sounds good. I mean, it, and it, it really is, it's baked into the whole plan to promote conservation, but uh, we, it, it's probably just not even fair to even attempt an answer at this point in time because it would just be a, an estimate, quite frankly. Um, another question, Mr. Farah, was uh, regarding riparian corridor regulations. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest in obviously protecting um, the, uh, Colga River, as well as uh, tributaries um, into the valley. Um, so could you speak to uh, any components that would address the riparian corridor? Yeah, so the nature corridors that we're talking about encompasses the riparian corridors, as well as um, when, they, when the headwaters are reached, that the nat nature natural corridor continues on to connect to the next one. And sometimes that some portion of that, that corridor might be a dry, dry corridor, that is to say there's not a riverine element running through it. But again, I'm going to, I get to kick this over to next year in the coding. Um, you know, we've started doing the process of the two towns have different riparian numbers, riparian setbacks. I think we're going to try and synchronize them and, and get similar standards in the two towns. Okay, super. You know, and if it's okay, Mr. Farr, we do have a, a number of other questions regarding the plan itself. So I'm going to stick with yeah. these if that's okay. Um, you know, one of our questions was, would um, the connected neighborhoods be residential or would they be walkable uh, kind of uh, shops or local businesses? And, and, and my gut instinct, it, it sounds like it would be a mixture that it's not, you're not necessarily recommending uh, uh, an or, it's an and, it's probably both. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the ideal neighborhood from a, putting out a planner's hat, the ideal neighborhood has a walk to center that I, without getting in my car, without fanciness, I can go to a place, maybe there's a coffee shop, maybe there's a daycare center, maybe there's a petite ballet where my kids go to, you know, go take dance class, whatever. There is a cluster of, small cluster of kind of walk to neighborhood serving services. That's the ideal of the new urbanism, sustainable urbanism across the country. So the ordinances should enable that. Um, for those businesses to thrive though, and Sharon Woods is on the call, I won't call on her, but basically, um, in the modern age to be a destination business, you often have to be visible off the street. And so if it's you know, tucked away in a neighborhood, it won't do very well if it can't thrive on the foot traffic it gets from that neighborhood. So, so that it'll tend to be residential, but where it's possible that we could support more, we'd love to do that. Okay, super. Um, and then a question came in regarding prioritization of the plan. And, uh, based upon at least my reading of it in your presentation tonight is that you, you by identifying these nodes, those are really kind of the, the low hanging fruit, if you will. Um, but is that, are there other uh, prioritization that are built into the plan that people will be able to see once they go to the website? Uh, so yeah, great question. So, you know, the way, the way we showed it in the four scales, kind of the vision and the name and the image, you know, is kind of a priority in that. 
that can be done by lots of agencies and units of government and you know private private businesses and so on can all contribute to that so that's kind of a everyone should be doing that i think the corridors particularly the nat nature corridors have to be sort of identified and mapped kind of up front you can't but whoops just developed it there was a river through it missed the opportunity so we've got to really kind of prioritize clarifying where those sensitive lands are we've i think we've got a good jump on it um, so that's a priority and then the two nodes um, you know that were chosen by the two towns before we started our work and i think they really are the kind of key opportunity sites in our two in the whole study area for each of the towns so so i think those were well chosen and i'm really excited about those and hope that that the mayors who are both been active participants in the process thus far um, can uh, uh, wield their uh, their swords and their magic wands and so on to make really good things happen here. Sounds good. And um, I don't know that I, I wanna make sure that I did not miss this question. Um, I don't think I did. I think I might've actually marked it off on my list here, but uh, does FAR recommend the city of Akron and city of Cuckaballs removing tax abatement for new development? I did not ask that question, did I? Mm -hmm. I, I did, okay, good. Did. Um, okay, good. Uh, so I didn't uh, accidentally mark it off. Um, but the, we had a, a secondary question come up regarding tax abatement, and the concern was any proposed tax abatement and how that would affect uh, the Woodward School District. And I think, uh, Ms. Kolbecki, I think you could probably address that question. Yes. Um, again, only um, Akron has a residential tax abatement in place in the Valley, but Cuyahoga Falls, if we were to pursue a TIF, which is an, uh, a different mechanism used to raise funds to get things done down there, like improved infrastructure, we would do the kind of TIF that would make the schools whole, that they would not necessarily take any hit on the project. And, and again, we just did this with our South Front Street revitalization project that's kicking off, approved by city council the other night. So uh, we can do that. We would, would want to do that. We will look to do that if we have the right project, the right development. That is something that we have talked about. And I, I think our friends in Akron would be interested in doing something as well. I don't want to put words in their mouth for the right commercial infrastructure type project. Sounds good. We've had a couple of questions, and I think these are really valid questions because um, not only is the Valley a destination for entertainment, um, for shopping, for residential, it is also a commuter uh, route uh, between you know different destinations in our community. So we've had a couple of questions regarding, you know, how might we address it? And I, and I know, Mr. Farr, you've definitely had a lot of thought about that. Uh, but I'm actually going to kind of lean into to my colleague, Mr. Segedy, because he is uniquely qualified, you know, being the former director of Akron Metropolitan Area Transportation Study. And you know, one of the specific questions is, you know, you know, how do these plans, you know, really connect with the heavy traffic flow that goes to the valley. Um, it, it looks like, you know, there might be some reduced uh, roads. And um, if so, you know, how will that impact, you know, the quality of life in the valley? And I, I think probably one of the answers, uh, Mr. Segedy, is that people adjust. Um, a lot of our roads actually are overbuilt in a lot of our areas. Some of them they're not. But uh, I, I think that's a really good question there. So if you wouldn't mind kind of uh, taking a crack at that, and then Mr. Farr, if you have any thoughts as well. Sure, and uh, I appreciate you saying that, Dan. I haven't forgotten about transportation. It's been six years, but I still, uh, I, will, I will never forget my long time at AMAT. So, uh, you know, I think like a lot of the changes that have been made to the traffic network in the valley, uh, a lot of people on this call can remember when Portage Path was a two-lane road with that green rusting uh, bridge over the Cuyahoga River, and it was widened when Merriman Road was widened. And I think the traffic situation, you know, in the Akron part of the valley over by Merriman Portage Path, the issue is not so much, there are plenty of lanes for the traffic. The issue is that intersection at Merriman and Portage Path that Doug and his team identified. And any of us, uh, which is probably almost all of us who drive through there regularly know, it's not so much that you're delayed uh, cruising down Portage Path or Merriman, it's when you get to that intersection. It's like a pipe that's wide enough until you get to where the two pipes meet and it's too narrow. And so I think that I, I, the city definitely recognizes that we need improvements at that intersection. I think the question becomes what type of improvements and I'm intrigued by what FAR and, and their team put together. 
uh, I think as was mentioned in the conversation, like the town green and the elongated roundabouts a really interesting idea. We're definitely committed to studying that and looking at it more. Uh, it probably would be costly. Uh, on the other hand, you know, people sitting in traffic for 90 seconds at that light and feeling like, you know what, I don't want to go to the valley anymore. That's costly too. So I, I think that we are interested in trying to flesh out that recommendation and to think about ways where we can make traffic flow better. And, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention just hearkening back to what we talked about earlier with pedestrians. We really want that intersection to work for everyone, you know, not for not just for cars, but there are a lot of people on bikes coming down the towpath. There are not a lot of bikes on the street right now. And if you ride a bike, you'll know why, you know, it's not very, uh, I love biking and I, I prefer the towpath in that area. And so I think we're trying to look at ways to make it more pedestrian friendly. And especially if the, the vision that was outlined earlier with buildings closer to the street and more residences in mixed use uh, is realized, you know, there's going to be more pedestrians, not less. And so I think we have to find a way to make that intersection work both for pedestrians and cars. So not an easy problem, but I think the recommendations here set us up really well to dig in a little bit deeper and think about what the best course of action is. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Shagety, because I'm also glad you mentioned the, the, the trails because that has been, there's been a couple of questions regarding the trails. And I think one of the questions was, you know, how will these plans affect, you know, the existing route of the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath trail? And I, you know, I, I, I tried to answer that, you know, uh, early on, and I could be entirely uh, incorrect, Mr. Farr, so please correct me, but my reading of it is that it's, it's, you're not recommending an overall change to the route of the Ohio and Erie Canal towpath trail. But however, what you are recommending is greater connectivity to that regional trail network to actually, you know, promote walking and bicycling, a more walkable bicycle community. Is that an accurate statement, sir? Absolutely. Now we're leaving the tow, tow path trail kind of where it is and building on it and connecting to it. And so uh, oftentimes it is off street. So as the rendering showed uh, and Jason was referring to, there'd be a promenade, there'd be a nice sidewalk that people, families would wanna walk along and go from the train station to the this and the that, to the canoe, whatever. Um, you know, uh, Danny, you'd asked my opinion a minute ago just about the streets and the, you know, uh, thoroughfares and so on. You know, one of the things that uh, we're trying to do is strike the right balance. So there are definitely commuters here, but there are also people who own businesses along the street. And one of the most fundamental things you can do to help a business is to provide parking in front of it. And so one of the casualties of uh, uh, the DOTs, the Departments of Transportation, prioritizing the through traffic was the businesses uh, are less going to be less successful because of that. So we'd like to rebalance that. Um, and then the second thing, just to say it to everybody, which is um, streets are often left to be the domain of traffic engineers. And traffic engineers are not people that make special places. Generally speaking, when a traffic engineer's been there, um, you want to stay in your car and you don't want to walk. So that's a tragedy of the modern age, but, but there are some great enlightened traffic engineers out there. And so one of the implementation steps we've called for in this plan is don't go to the regular, you know, traffic engineer that knows how to widen a street or, you know, uh, add six lanes or sort of like that. It's a different skill set, and they're out there. And so, uh, just to there's a little finesse in terms of how this might get implemented. Sounds good. Um, speaking of, you know, kind of the, the local businesses. Um, we have a number of questions you know, regarding that. And um, one of our questions was, um, do we have any research or data um, regarding the willingness and interest of the, of the existing property owners to uh, be involved in the placemaking? I, I know some people, this is a, a new concept, um, but I think it, it is a valid question. And, and, and in, Mr. Farr, in, in the surveys and in, in conversations with local businesses, is there anything that we, we have uh, to, to kind of give us a sense of, of, of the level of interest there? And then uh, Ms. Colvecchio, Mr. Segni, please feel free to chime in. Sure, I can tell you what I was exposed to and, and leave it to Jason and Diana to, to uh, add. So during the charrette, we met with, let's probably say, 10 to 15 different landowners and business owners in the two nodes and in the city area in general. Um, I would say to a person, um, people were really eager to be involved, to know what was going on. Um, when 
uh, to a person also, people would sit me down and say, I own this, or this is my business, or my house is here. You know, tell me what's going to change or tell me what, what I can do different. And so there really is, um, I think there was a, an eagerness to listen and to see where the plan might go. And so um, this, is, this is in some ways the launch of that uh, process. And so it is a living, you know, the plan will be, hopefully will be adopted by the two towns and then the codes and so on will be developed and adopted shortly thereafter in the new year. Um, but it then becomes a living document. And so um, it is, uh, you know, it is made, made whole by the interaction of the private citizens and the towns and the agencies uh, to make it, you know, to fulfill as much of the plan vision as, the, as, as, as they see fit. So, uh, Diana, Jason? Uh, yeah, I think you, you covered it uh, very well there, Doug. They've been invited to the table from the very beginning and we have been keeping them in the loop. Uh, we put them on the list of stakeholders to be people who would weigh in on, very, on this plan at various stages. And I think our landowners out there are probably more than anyone else, more anxious to see how this is gonna affect their lives because the rest of us are gonna watch and listen and you know, implement but it's their land that's going to be impacted. So that direct impact to them uh, is going to be profound. And uh, I, I, I am anxious to see what they think of what they saw here tonight and get their comments of what they see when they finally see the draft plan. And I would say like Doug, from based on my conversations with landowners, I think landowners, you know, many of the landowners in the Valley inherited the building that they're currently located in. They weren't the person who actually built it. I think a lot of the property owners you would find are very open to, uh, you know, ultimately perhaps changing those buildings or being open to rebuilding in the future. But I think what landowners understandably expect is, you know, some predictability and consistency and, and having an idea of what the plan is. And I think that's one of the best things about this planning process is in the absence, you know, when I started as planning director in 27 or 2016, many landowners would come to me and say things like, I'm just so happy that I know what the city even wants in this given area. And so I think that's one of the great things about a master plan is it outlines a vision. And it's not so much that every single aspect of it has to be followed uh, to the letter, I think the plans are a great guide, but it's more for property owners to have an idea of where the city's heads are at. And I, I know, I think speaking for, you know, Diana can correct me if I'm wrong, but speaking for both communities, we very much value the existing property owners and want to work with them uh, both on renovating their buildings or perhaps building new. And so I think this plan does do a good job and, and, you know, we'll be eager to get input from the public on the draft. And I'll touch on that at the very end that, you know, this is very much a fluid process, but, uh, you know, to have a process where we've got uh, opportunities for landowners, but we can be responsible stewards of the Valley at the same time. Sounds good. We have a number of questions regarding, you know, how do we maintain what we have? Um, and, uh, you know, how do you manage, you know, kind of the quality of the businesses? And I, and I, I think those are kind of challenging questions to ask, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but, uh, but I just least wanted to throw that out there. Um, and there's also questions regarding, you know, these are great ideas now, um, but, you know, what do we do in the interim here? Um, you know, what can we do kind of now versus, you know, where we're going in the future? Well, let's oh, go ahead, Mr. Farr. I was just, I'll be brief and just say, you know, the, the plan based on prior experience, the plan takes, you know, several months, a year or so to be sort of fully adopted and socialized out in the world. And so nothing changes too quickly. Um, one of the things that we haven't focused on that much, but is something, there's a thing called tactical interventions. And oftentimes uh, when you're doing placemaking, like the design of the Civic Green, rather than build it, you know, it's a, you know, million dollar, multi-billion dollar project. Let's try it out kind of on a weekend and make sure that people like it and that the cars can get by and things like that. So that there's opportunities to prototype 
uh, what it might become um, in the years to come. And those can happen, you know, in a few months time, which are for businesses to sort of test out, would I get more customers if I build them more closer to the street? Let's let's do a little pop-up for a weekend and sort of see how that works or cross, cross marketing thing with the kayak livery or, you know, all, all those kinds of things. So there's a lot of, the, that was the surprise to me when we finally got to the charrette and all the, the eco tourism entrepreneurs started coming out of the woodwork. Like there's a whole network of them. They know each other. They're really hustling and uh, it's really exciting. So I think that I would throw, f uh, you know, fuel on that flame. Gotcha. Okay. Um, a couple of questions regarding kind of the boundary. Um, will this uh, pr proposed Merriman Valley plan address uh, the Tice Road um, development? And um, what about uh, the imp any, epic, any impact regarding North and West of Papa Joe's? I think that would probably be, uh, well, actually both Ms. Colbecchio and Mr. Segedy. Yeah, maybe I'll start on the Tice Road development. So the if I, if I understand where the questioner is probably talking about, they're probably talking about the parcel at the Northeast corner of Hardy Road and Tice Road uh, that's owned by the city of Akron. Uh, we did put out a request for proposals for both uh, de residential development and conservation of that parcel. Mayor Horrigan hasn't made any decisions on that yet. He's considering to, or continuing to consider different options. Uh, it's not part of the footprint of this plan. The reason for that is this plan is really focused more on the arterial corridors of Merriman and Akron Peninsula, uh, Portage Path and Portage Trail. But I think it's absolutely fair to say that some of the planning principles or ideas in this plan will certainly inform the way that, you know, the mayor looks at uh, development in this area outside of the footprint. So even though that parcel is not part of the footprint of this plan, uh, the mayor is going to take into consideration some of the things that are recommended here. Um, I guess really with that, I don't have anything more to add on that. He hasn't made a decision yet. Uh, I don't anticipate him making a decision until sometime next year. Uh, but you know, we'll we'll keep people informed about where that stands. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions regarding uh, maybe it's some incentives, um, and uh, and again, I think this is again to uh, Mr. Segedy and Ms. Colvecchio. Are there any funds available for redevelopment along Merriman Road? And um, you know, the question is, are there any incentives for some of those existing businesses, you know, uh, along there already? um to maybe relocate um so we can actually you know put in some of these proposed uh you know land use changes um any thoughts on that yeah I, i'd be happy to start and i'll be brief but you know we we have a great streets program in the city of akron so we've got uh i'm losing track of the count now but i think around 13 areas that are designated as great streets areas where the city of Akron will provide um, assistance for businesses, facade grants and some other biz small business assistance. The Merriman Valley is one of them, particularly on the Merriman Road corridor. Uh, like Diana mentioned earlier, we have some stipulations with our community development block grant funds that we get from the federal government. They are income based and so certain census tracts are not eligible, but we've been pretty creative in trying to assist businesses. We care a lot about the businesses in the Valley. I think we'll continue to do what, what we can uh, to assist them. It's an important business district. I'll just tack on to that, that in Cargo Falls, we're having internal discussions about using uh, funds in our CR, CIC, our Community Improvement Corporation, which is a, an arm of our economic development department. Uh, that we can use to assist businesses with small uh, small loans, or not small loans, but low interest loans that are uh, have deferred payments attached to them. And that kind of funding can help jumpstart a, a business to redevelop, uh, help jumpstart brand new development. Uh, it's less restricted than the HUD money that we use with our CDBG. And uh, recently our finance director was gracious enough to give our CRC uh, $2 million from our ARPA funds that we received in our municipality. So um, starting January 1, we're going to go back to the book and start looking at the regulations on loans and revolving loans for the C from the CIC to potential projects and take it from there. 
Okay. Um, kind of coming back to, to the plan itself, um, Mr. Farr, uh, there's some questions regarding building standards and, and what type of um, either incentives or uh, language. And I know you're, you're developing it, so I don't necessarily want to put you yeah. on the spot too much here, but, but to really give us some teeth, give us some structure. So, because these are really great designs, but how do we ensure that those great designs and images transfer to what actually happens on the landscape? Yeah, so great question. So again, I get to kick it over to my friend Lee Einsweiler to say <laughs> that the images I showed you were, it goes from a plan to a kind of vision of here's what we'd like to see there. Um, I showed just one page of a typical code that Lee and other uh, skilled people like him would write, but it basically, it spells out in great detail where the front door should be, on the front, where the parking should be, on the back, you know, that the, that the front of a building should not be a blank wall. You know, those sort of basic things can be written into the codes. The special stuff at the four corners, for example, um, on the Cuyahoga Valley node, that's a kind of extra layer on top where you actually would be much more concerned with kind of the architect's moves, you know, uh, projecting cornice, projecting roof, uh, door facing diagonally to the corner. So he has the power through the codes he writes to tighten the screws and, you know, kind of be much more specific where it really matters. And so you know, Lee's, Lee's the master. Um, and there's, if you just, if anyone wants to just Google um, form-based codes images, you'll see around the country, the kind of beautiful development that can happen by the private sector uh, under, under the regulations and under the guidance of a form-based code. So um, uh, locally in Cuyahoga, Falls, our firm was actually involved in writing a form-based code for one part of town that turned out pretty well. Diana, maybe you can uh, say a sentence about that. So that was a good walkable place uh, that developed over many years. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Were you talking? I was looking at the questions over here and preparing. You're talking about the walkable place where in the falls? Um, Far Associates did a, a oh. form-based code. Yep. Yeah. Oh, for downtown. Yeah. Yeah, we hope, as everybody uh, from Cuyahoga Falls knows, hopefully some of the folks on this call realize, uh, we were instrumental in reopening South or North Front Street to vehicular traffic as a result of the hard work that the FAR team put into assisting us. And that's proven to be a game changer for our downtown district. In fact, the South Front Street project I was referring to uh, moments ago is just gonna be an extension to improve the footprint of our downtown. But uh, part and parcel of of uh, reopening the street, we did a marketing analysis and a marketing plan. And uh, the, the results of that revealed that that area wouldn't thrive and we really wouldn't see uh, a bunch of new businesses take off for four or five years. And we saw the, the new development started to land in two years. So we were quite shocked that just reopening that street turned out to be quite the impressive feat that it did. And we all enjoy it now. There's plenty of restaurants and dining and uh, shopping experiences there. And uh, basically uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a risk for those business owners, those landowners. That will be the same case here, but they, they were vested in, and uh, we appreciated their investment and, and their risk. And we, we took also a risk, it cost the city some $14 million to do that project. And it is absolutely paid off. Uh, people come from all over Northeast Ohio to see our, our new downtown. Okay. Um, we have a couple of questions um, regarding phasing and next steps. And I know we're, we're trying to get us through as many of the questions as possible. And I really appreciate everybody's patience. Um, but we have a lot of questions and a lot of, you know, kind of similar questions. So if we don't get to all the questions, we will do our best to answer them following this meeting. So so I appreciate your patience, um, but uh, I'm a one person operation doing this. So doing the best we can. Uh, question regarding phasing and next step, Mr. Farr. Um, and uh, if you can kind of just talk about yeah. the phasing of it. And then I think sure. when we wrap up, Mr. Segedy, we'll talk about next steps. You bet. So in the two, you know, there's a whole kind of protocol for adopting the plan. So that, and, and Diana and Jason can talk about that. What I would say is in the two redevelopment nodes, um, you know, the public said, when, when it comes to redevelopment, given where we are and the heavy lift we have to do to get to where we want to, a walkable, beautiful uh, place that is kind of reflective and commensurate with the natural beauty that surrounds us, that's going to be a heavy lift. And so the way this goes is the plan gets adopted. 
and each town we have urged in the plan to assign staff and resources to make the plan happen. And so, um, you know, sometimes uh, individual building owners or landowners can act without having to be in concert with anybody else to sort of it's in their self-interest. They have the agency to do what they need to do. Oftentimes though, these plans require sort of coordinated investment. You know, the city might be building an improved street. Well, time the private development to take advantage of that, right? So that coordination, uh, would come that leadership and coordination would come from the two towns um, and it would unfold uh, over a number of years. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. All right. Um, there was a question early on. Um, let's see, I want to scroll back up to it. Um, really regarding the engagement of, of renters um, and that how might we, you know, make sure that we are engaging them. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's a, well, that's another challenging question. I know there's been a lot of outreach. Um, and so I, I guess I'll throw it really um, to Ms. Colvecchio and Mr. Segedi, and, and, and again, I'd be happy to, to help in any way as possible, but I know that's always a challenge in other neighborhoods in, in both Calgary Falls and Akron. Um, it's always a challenge, um, but if we have any thoughts regarding that, because that, there's a concern in, in one of the questions embedded is that, you know, how do you you know, ensure that people are not necessarily displaced. And, and we know that um, socioeconomic mixing is a good thing and, and that it, it really means gentrification, but if it result, results in displacement, it's not acceptable. So I don't know if Ms. Colvecchio, Mr. Segedi, you have any thoughts on, on engagement of, of residents? Um, and, and maybe this is something we just continue further uh, in the future. Sure, well, we have absolutely tried to publicize this process, this very public process. Uh, every step of the way. And there have been many, many places along this, uh, this timeline that have been uh, set aside and made available for input for, for everyone in, in this area to come forward and give us their thoughts and concerns. So press releases, ads in newspapers, websites, social media, Facebook, Instagram, all, all of this, all of these meetings get pushed out. Uh, there has been some suggestion by some of the participants in this process that we actually uh, go door to door or put flyers at doors. And I have, I, I will admit to you, I have kind of left that up to the individual uh, council people who, who those, those resident, those apartment residents live in their, in their ward. We, we did some of that with, um, in Cuyahoga Falls, the Ward 8 council person was kind enough to do that and go door to door. Uh, but Again, this process isn't over, and uh, it's my understanding that some of the council people in Akron are still intending to do just that with some of the units in Akron and hold another sort of what we call a listening tour style of meeting with uh, residents and try to get many of them to come forward and uh, solicit their feedback. So it's difficult. Uh, you can you can do so much. You can you know it's the old adage: you can lead a horse to water, but certainly. As I said earlier, their input is critical. We want to hear from them and anybody of the 200 and some people plus who are listening in today, if anything at all that they can do to get the word out is greatly appreciated because uh, we think of that and we think and, and we're hesitant about moving forward without that input. Uh, input. It's, 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 uh, it, it, it has to happen. Yeah, and I just add that uh, similar to what Diana said, we've had great conversations, you know, myself in particular with Councilwoman Holland and Councilman Malik in Akron. I know they both care deeply about engaging uh, renters in this process. Like Diana said, you know, it's it's a little bit more difficult with renters because uh, you know they're not homeowners and and they turn over a little bit more often, but. Again, like I said earlier, I think one of the great successes of the Valley, it's overwhelmingly a renter occupied neighborhood and that uh, renters are the vast majority of the population in the Valley. And so, uh, while I think we need to do everything we can to uh, reach out to them. I do think, you know, we already have an area that's naturally uh, a diverse area of housing types and types of, uh, occupants of housing, whether they're renter occupied or owner occupied. And I think that's the success that we really can build on with this plan. And like Doug said earlier, getting more quote unquote missing middle uh, housing, you know, to provide options for a lot of different kinds of people. I think the Valley is actually really well positioned for that. 
Okay. Um, you know, there's a couple just ones I'll just kind of wrap up with. And my apologies to, you know, I know there's still 45 questions out there and I'm, I'm scrolling through and trying to you know, get as many as we can and, and also kind of, you know, uh, kind of put similar questions together. But please be assured that we will make sure that we do, uh, you know, get this uh, information and try to answer those questions and make it available on the website. Um, but uh, I guess one of the quick questions is really um, regarding the environmental uh, impacts of this plan. And I, and I think, Mr. Farr, you were really addressed this earlier when you talked about riparian corridors. Um, there's concerns about, you know, um, studies, you know, you know, about any potential development, how that's going to have an impact on the waterway, how it's going to have an impact, obviously, on Lake Erie. Um, but can you maybe just kind of circle back on that? Because we've had a couple comments about that. Uh, well, thank you. So, you know, again, I get to toss this over to, to Lee and the code. Um, but, you know, uh, there are best practice ordinances on, on kind of every category of, of conservation, you know, that, that I think folks in the Valley would be interested in. So that could be riparian setbacks, which you've talked about. That could be uh, tree cover ordinances. There are ordinances for that. We've proposed the kind of nat nature quarters, the scenic byway quarters, all of those things are also overlays and ordinances that exist other places. Um, we've also suggested that there are <laughs> excuse me, you know, a couple things that we think are, are important that haven't really been in the conversation thus far, dark sky being one of them that, you know, if you go out to the valley, part of being in nature is you don't see the glow of the city, you're there to see the sky. So that's a, that can be a, some people see it as intrusive, their idea of a well maintained property is a floodlight left on 24 hours, you know, shining on the on the parking lot. Well, that's a benefit for the parking lot and a degradation for the whole area. So, so anyway, there's any topic you want to to kind of dial up the conservation aspect to um, there exists in the world in the United States an ordinance uh, that's been in place for some number of years and you can sort of kick the tires and figure out if it's you know suited to Akron or Cuyahoga or both so so you know we we've we've suggested the ones we've suggested but you know again there's a wild wild world out there and Lee will uh, be your ambassador to it sounds good and I you know, I want to kind of wrap it up, uh, you know, because I'm trying to, again, scroll through them. And I think we, we, I know there's definitely some questions we did not get addressed. And my apologies. Um, we really tried to get through this um, as efficiently as possible. And, you know, obviously we'll work with a new system here. But um, we got, we have also gotten really good, good feedback. So thank you all so much for taking the time to stick with this. At our highest point, we had 236 participants, which is amazing. Um, and I think as many as 60 some questions or comments, I know there's definitely some comments in there as well as, as questions. Um, a lot of questions regarding, you know, uh, tourism, uh, campsites. Um, and, and again, all those are, are, are really important questions about environmental concerns. Um, but so I, I really appreciate that. We will do our best to get those questions answered. Uh, but one of the questions early on, which I, I also shared was, in the vision statement, uh, Mr. Farr, and really Ms. Ms. Colvecchio, Mr. Segedi, it talks about a gateway um, to Cauga Valley National Park. But the question really was, is it not only just exclusively a gateway to Cauga Valley National Park, but it really is a gateway to the city of Cauga Falls. It really is a gateway to the city of Akron. And um, I, I guess I'd like to kind of close on that comment because I think that's a really a valid point that if we, if we focus exclusively on the national park, I think it, it does an injustice to those two communities um, that really see the Merriman Valley as an asset. So uh, maybe, I, I, Mr. Sagan, it looks like you've come off mute there first. I'll let you have that. Sure, and I'll be brief so uh, Doug and Diana can uh, jump in, but I totally agree. I, I think the Valley is undoubtedly a gateway to the National Park, but similarly, as you said, uh, Dan, and as the questioner indicated, it's a gateway to downtown Akron. It's a gateway to Cuyahoga Falls. Uh, I think the, the valley kind of functions as like this transitional area uh, between both communities as well as a, a, an entrance to the national park. So I think that's one reason it's very important is it's kind of this crossroads. You know, there's a big traffic flow of people between Fairlawn and Montrose and Cuyahoga Falls and Stowe that come through the valley. There are a lot of people uh, that live in the valley. There are a lot of people that live in the valley and work in Akron. There are a lot of people that live in the valley in work or shop in Cuyahoga Falls. So I think that's one of the most important things about the Valley is that uh, it, it would be a mistake to view it as just one 
uh, like uh, like having one niche. I think it's actually got a lot of niches and that's what makes it a very interesting and somewhat complicated place to plan. Ms. Colvecchio or Mr. Farr, anything you'd like to add? I'll just quickly add on that, you know, one of the goals of both of our communities is that we want to take those 7 million visitors who come to the Kaga Valley uh, National Park every year and harness them and all that energy that they bring and get them to travel up Portage Trail to, to Cuyahoga Falls or up Portage Path to Akron or Smith Road to the Fairlawn area. That's the goal here. So, you know, when we talk about this place being a gateway, what we're also saying is that, um, you know, and not in the traditional sense that it's just a gateway for people to come and stay in the valley, but to bring them into the valley so that they see then there's another way up out of the valley where there's a whole lot of other things for them to do and how to spend their time. And along those lines is, um, I mean, one of the things we're going to be focused on is overnight lodging because I, now most of those people who come and visit spend the day. We want them to spend the night. We want them to have a reason to spend the night. So that plays into this as, as well. And I think we're, we both agree on that. The, the Both cities see that there has to be more done to create more lodging in this area. Well, I'm glad yeah. you said that, Ms. Colbeckio, because that, that definitely was a theme in, in some of the questions that we were not able to get to is that there's, there's a real interest in camping. There's a real interest in RVs. Mm. Um, and so I, I think and I know, I know from having your connect with the Topaz Trail, that is a great need, uh, that there is not enough lodging for util utilizers of the Topaz Trail. So Mr. Farr, uh, you get the last word. Uh, wow, that's scary. But uh, thanks for that opportunity. No, I was going to say that um, one, I'll just say it, municipalities do their best planning in their downtowns and in their neighborhoods. And it's just, it's the nature of the beast that at the edge of town, when you may have annexed, and it's kind of, you're not even clear who's what land is in whose town? It's the it's this uh, the stepchild that doesn't get the the love um, uh, that the downtown gets, and so this project sort of inverts that, which is to say, for uh, several months and I hope for years to come, this edge of town has gotten attention and it will have a plan that has uh, good bones and hopefully good teeth when the codes are adopted. Um, and we have had the conversation just amongst the team to say there's no reason that these ideas shouldn't apply to all edges of Akron and all edges of Cuyahoga Falls that are kind of out there, tendrils butting up against nature. Um, and so this is a model, no extra charge. Steal these ideas. Diana, Jason, steal these ideas, do it across town. Mayors, steal these ideas, do it in other parts of town. So um, I did want to sort of close to say there's a slide that I, if I can show you, um, talks about next steps. Can folks see that slide? So um, this is um, so this will be on the screen. If you want to take a picture of it with your phone, whatever. Here's all the places you can. Uh, the slides will be posted. Written comments to Valley Plan. You know all this sort of stuff. Draft draft plan will be posted in January. Um, the two websites and then the form based code development will take place January to March of next year. So anything more to say about this slide, Jason or Diana? Yeah, actually, I want to kick it over to Jason. He's going to kind of review the next steps. So please go ahead, Jason. Go. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, Dan. And I think like Dan said, uh, well, a couple of things. I, I can't tell all of you enough how much we appreciate uh, your participation and your input. Uh, we've, uh, by my count, we've gone about two hours and 13 minutes. And a lot of you have foregone or delayed uh, dinner plans or time with family. So I thank you for coming out. Um, I, th I think one of the big uh, intents of what we're doing here tonight is to give you some time to think about and digest and react to what you heard this evening. This isn't the final plan. Uh, this is a draft set of recommendations. Uh, I, a lot of people I know uh, weren't able to get all their questions answered. Uh, like Doug and Dan just mentioned, the slide that's up on the screen uh, gives you some information on where you can email further questions. Uh, we are going to put the slide presentation and a recording of this Zoom meeting up on our websites, hopefully tomorrow, uh, but if not tomorrow, very soon. Uh, if you did, again, if you didn't get your question answered tonight, please reach out and email uh, at the address that you see on there. We'll do our best to answer. 
Um, we are going to put another survey out on uh, both cities' websites. The consultant team uh, is going to make some modifications to the draft plan uh, to respond to some of the feedback we've gotten tonight and to any additional feedback that we get over the next couple weeks. We touched on this briefly, but uh, we're going to put a draft of the entire plan document out in January. So you'll have an opportunity. You know, this was the recommendations. Uh, the team's working on the, the details of the plan, but the document will go out uh, in January. And as Doug and some others on, the, on uh, this meeting mentioned, at the same time, we're going to start working in earnest uh, with Lee and his team on the specifics of a new zoning code for the planning area. I personally think zoning is the single most important action that we can take to modify uh, how the development happens in the valley. I mean, zoning has the force of law. It's very important. Uh, that's going to take place in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, we're then going to wrap up the planning process. Uh, I think it'll take collaboration from both our city administrations and our city councils to adopt any zoning changes that come out of this. Uh, a little bit more on how that'll work. Uh, when the plan's wrapped up, the two cities will continue to work uh, together on further developing the master plan recommendations. Uh, like I alluded to earlier, we'll take new zoning at some point to our planning commissions and our city councils uh, where they'll weigh in. There'll be further opportunity for property owners and all of you uh, to share input via our formal public hearing processes. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think I can't think of a better group of people to be working on it together. Uh, that includes everybody who's on this call tonight. Uh, we really appreciate the engagement, interest, and feedback that all of you have shared and will continue to share as the planning process uh, develops and unfolds. Uh, we will look forward to more dialogue, more partnerships, and more progress toward a better plan, Merriman Valley, a better Akron, and a better Cuyahoga Falls. So I think with that, unless any of my other colleagues have uh, anything to add, I'd like to thank you and uh, wish all of you a good evening. Thank you very much.